Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Industry AF. My name is James Frolio. I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Tyler Boone. And today, we have with us Mark Ellis. Mark is a professional comedian, actor, and host, a headlining stand-up that's played to sold-out shows all over the world and on television. Mark has a monstrous online following as the co-host of Movie Trivia Schmodown, his cinematic combat-style trivia show that has over 300,000 subscribers and over 350 million views on YouTube. Mark recently released his new stand-up hour special, Dog Stepfather, produced by Bill Burr and All Things Comedy, as well as another TV set for an upcoming Comedy Central project. His acting has been showcased in film, television, and numerous national commercials, and he regularly appears as a commentator on many major networks, a stable at conventions, a staple at conventions like Comic Con, festivals such as South by Southwest, and comedy clubs across the nation. Mark currently lives in LA, does not play second base for the Dodgers, and recently continued his winning streak of being invited to every Star Wars movie premiere with the rise of Skywalker. Yes, he loved it. Come at him. <laughs> you can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Mark Ellis Live. Mark. Welcome to the show. Yeah, well, that was back when uh, Star Wars still made movies. You see, now it's just TV shows. Totally. It's just, you get a new TV show, Star Wars, every week, and I'm I'm just more of a movie guy, so that's why I get so excited to go see, like, a Star Wars movie in, you know, like a dark theater, giant screen, awesome sound system. Where is it? Chinese uh, theater? The That was at the Chinese theater, I believe. That's cool. Is where they did that premiere. That's yeah, amazing. so I'm just I'm just like a stupid country bumpkin who just like kind of fell into this whole movie reviewing thing in addition to stand-up, and then it gained some steam, and then me and my buddy Christian Harloff, who started Schmo's No together, which became the Schmodown, uh, we just started getting invited to these things, and we're like, holy crap, we're like rubbing shoulders with, you know, Mark Hamill and George Lucas. This Didn't is he just nuts. go to one? Um, I went to the, the most recent one I went to was Avatar, the way That's of water. Was. That was, that <laughs> was sick, man. Compared to the first one. Three hours. Wow. Of scuba diving for me. Cause like you have the 3d glasses <laughs> and like, it looks so real. That's insane. And I was like ready to get my life on my way out of the theater. I felt like I should have just been gifted a license to scuba dive. <laughs> I'm like, I get it. I know how to hold my breath after watching this movie. But it was cool, man. That's sick, man. On the edge of your seat, huh? Well, Mark, thanks for being here, man. <laughs> I wanted to bring you on here because one of my first pocket podcast experiences in Los Angeles was with you. Yeah. In Burbank, man. That yeah. was 2020, 2021. We did the Jam in the Van thing, and then uh, you were our host, and we did put up the, the Hollywood Jam with Ryan Sickler. You were the host at the Troubadour, man. At the Troubadour, man, a legendary <laughs> rock venue. And so all of us musicians, comedians, we're kind of like geeking out backstage because this is the Troubadour, and we've heard all the legendary stories. And it just does not fail. Every time you go to one of those cool Hollywood, like, legendary venues, mm -hmm. you're just sitting in the green room like, oh, like, you're, these Who walls was here? can talk. Yeah, you know? yeah the, uh, it's kind of like going to the Rainbow Bar. So, yeah. You know what I mean? The first time you go in there, the yep. rug's never been changed. So, yeah, man, we just the wanted... The smell is always the same, too. It it's smells like, like shit. It smells like detergent and puke from the yeah. night before. And you're like, but I wonder who puked here. That's the question. Somebody famous. Was it Alice Cooper? You know? <laughs> well, I mean, dude, I just, I'm just such a fan. And uh, we're just so glad you came on, man. So Likewise. I, every time I see you and, you and James on stage, I'm like, oh, right. I'm friends with, like, talented people. <laughs> And you got to remind yourself of that because we're just like dudes hanging out. For sure. And then you guys get on stage and like actually have chops. Well, I mean, dude, you know, you, you're, you're such a guy that I look up to because, you know, I mean, you were a full-time comic, full-time entrepreneur, right? Yeah, I work yeah. for myself. And yeah. every time around the holidays, I get reminded how lucky I am because around the holidays, what comics do so we can buy our family presents is uh, corporate gigs. 
Oh. Right, so like every office is like closing up. They have their like end of the year Hollywood party, yeah. um, or holiday party, and so they'll hire comedians. And it usually is not a venue conducive to stand up whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So it usually ends pretty terribly. But they pay well. Totally. But what I'm reminded of is like it's you see the speeches because you're there all night. So you see the speeches like the boss and like thanking all the employees, and you see all the employees trying to like network and get one last. Talk sort of with like, the boss. Hurrah, like, you know, climb the company ladder before yep. the everybody breaks for the Christmas and stuff. And I'm just like, thank God I'm not stuck in this. Totally. It just seems like such totally. a – people think stand-up is hard. I'm like, that's easy. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's such a funny perspective. <laughs> well, I mean, stand-up's a piece of cake. It's it's having to deal with people in an office. That's what's going to make me break out in hives. Well, let's – you know, <clears throat> we're going to talk about a lot of things, man, but when did you start comedy? And where are you from? I am from Virginia. Is where we sort of grew up when my dad got out of the Air Force. So I was born in North Carolina okay. in Winston Salem, home of Krispy Kreme <laughs> and like a lot of cigarettes. And then we moved all around the country. And then I went back to school for college. I went to Wake Forest, which is in Winston Salem. Yep. So I kind of went back to the birthplace. And then after I graduated, I pretty much made the decision like, I want to do stand up. And so I either need to live in New York or Los Angeles ultimately. Totally. LA is warm. Allegedly, yeah. Although now I've lived in LA too long, so like anytime it gets below seventy, I'm like, "What is this Green Bay? God damn it!" But I knew I didn't want to be in New York for the winters, and I had a buddy who was living out here, mm -hmm. so I moved out here, slept on his couch. What year? Uh, that would be 2003, March of 2003. Okay. Because I got out there and immediately I hit the ground running doing open mics, and it was the March Madness tournament had just started. So, so you knew exactly. What was I was March. just watching basketball all day and like trying open mics at night. Where'd you first move to? I moved right in Hollywood. I got nice. super lucky where my buddy lived because he lived on Fairfax and Sunset, cool. like a block north of that. So I could walk to the Laugh Factory. I could walk to the Comedy Store. Mm -hmm. And that's how you make your, your living as a comic when you start out is Around. you're not making a living, but you're just meeting people and you find your class. Life sure. is really never graduating from high school because everybody has their little cliques. Totally. And they have, who do you hang out with? Who do you jive with well? And the same thing is true when you're a comedian and you're doing open mics, especially in a bigger city where there's a lot of places to tell jokes around. There's, mm -hmm. there's some comedy clubs that have open mic nights. There's restaurants, bars, coffee shops. So you sort of see the same people. And those are like your homeroom For after sure. a while, right? And yeah. then you realize who is sort of falling into line with your way of thinking and who has the same goals as you. For sure. And so it may not necessarily be lifelong friendships, but for that period of time, you're really tight with your class. It's like the people you're coming up with. Yeah. You can use that with music. Same thing. We came from Charleston, and eventually I knew. I was like, I need to get out of here. I need to ultimately be in L.A. Mm -hmm. Don't want to be where it's cold. But the people you came up with were kind of like your coworkers. We're not making really money together, but I could talk to you about my day. Yeah. If, I go, if I go on a date with a girl that works at some office, and I go, oh, you know, <laughs> they, they just start going, oh, my God, I thought you were cool. <laughs> you know? I thought musicians were supposed just, to be cool. But, but you're so depressed, you know? <laughs> and so it's nice to, to hear the same thing. With I, I, That's why I fell in love. You know, working with people like you and our buddy Rafa, we always want to bring him on the podcast yeah. to the comedians because we kind of, we kind of relate a little bit. We're totally different, but but we're also kind of the same. You know what I mean? There is something inherently nuts about wanting to be on stage in front of people yeah. and craving that attention. Like the ultimate version of it is wanting to be president of the United States. <laughs> like you're just a damaged individual if you think you can run 350 million people and you can be in charge of the most of powerful that. country on earth. It's yeah. like, there's 8 billion of us on earth. Yeah, I can run the show. Like who thinks that? And so the much more in. downgraded version of that is being a musician. Like I can entertain these people yeah. or being a comedian. Like I can make these people laugh. Totally. But you get up there and you do it. And I think some of the things that the audiences appreciate the most about us is that, you know, we, we did kind of throw caution to the wind early in our lives. And we made that decision, like, I'm just going to go for this thing. Totally. And it's a little inspiring. And then, you know, in turn, we, as the outliers, as the hippie artists of the community, mm -hmm. we're inspired by the audience because they're laughing or they're clapping. And, you know, they, they're adults. They have 401ks and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So one of them is going to be putting us into the home yeah, eventually. Ab absolutely. That's the, that's the hope. Well, then, you know, uh, and I know James has a, uh, he did a lot of research on it. He has a lot of questions, but... You know, when when was it? I see how you guys do this show now. <laughs> Is it Tyler <laughs> yeah. butters you up with the softballs? And then here comes James, like okay. St. Peter at the pearly gates of heaven. Mark, did you steal <laughs> from Sister Carol in seventh grade religion class? I'm going to pull up old <laughs> tweets. <laughs> hey, did you say this? Uh, no, but I, I wanted to ask him, when did you know? I love asking other artists or entrepreneurs or whatever. When did you know, like, all right, man, like, I'm doing this? Like, not like I'm going to be a comedian. Like, when you kind of knew, like, quote, unquote, you're starting to make it. 
um, you'll be my first phone call. No. You'll be the first time that I that I realized that I'm like, well, hey, I mean, Tyler, but, I did it. But it's what you do. It's what you're doing full time. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it, it was probably around 2007, uh, eight, nine, somewhere around there where I had been hired at the comedy store mm -hmm. to work. Because what the comedy store will do is Which they'll one? hire young comedians. The one that's right on Sunset. Okay. Cool. The one in, in La Jolla in San Diego does that too, where if you want to do stand-up, you do the open mics at you know either respective place. Totally. And then you can work your way up the ladder to the point where you actually have a job there, where you're either parking cars or you're selling the tickets or answering the phones or cleaning up puke or whatever you're doing. For sure. And you make a little bit of cheddar on the side, but you also have more stage time. And and again, it's just you're you're part of that community, yeah. especially the comedy store, because that's like a pirate ship of, of artists. For sure. And it's a fun time and you learn how to do it. And you see the classes that came before you and you just see you hear the stories like you. Somebody just got back from doing the road and somebody else is doing a TV taping in a couple nights. And you just kind of watch how they prepare. That's cool. And so it's cool. It's sort of a nice bird's eye view. And then eventually you meet comics and they see you on stage and maybe you're a good opening act for them. For so sure. a guy named John Caparula, who's a great comedian, uh, took me on the road and let me feature for him. First time we did a gig together was New Year's Eve in Nashville. It was the whole weekend at leading up Zanies? to New Year's Eve at Zany's in cool. Nashville. Cool. And I guess I did well enough. And so we just started booking some dates together. And awesome. going I... from doing five minutes or eight minutes in L.A. to getting to stretch your legs and do like 20 or 30 minutes featuring That's for a powerhouse who sells out comedy clubs like John Caparulo. That's so cool. You learn so much about who you are and what your goals are and what sure. you want to accomplish and if you're funny or not. Yeah, absolutely. So that's when I started to be like, oh, I think I can pay the rent doing this. That's awesome. Yeah. But <clears throat> you've always stuck in L.A. You didn't go to Chicago for a minute and live there. You didn't go to New York. No, nope. Pandemic happened, and I was like, I think I'm going to stick it out. A lot of comedians were like, I'm either going to Austin or I'm going to Florida Austin, or I'm going to yeah. Nashville. Yeah. But, um, no, I decided to stick it out. I mean, I had some pretty good TV opportunities here. I still do. Cool. And so I, I wanted to maintain those relationships. And with stand-up, it was really rough where, like, I had to turn my brain off during the pandemic as far as like coming up with new stuff for a while just because it it hurt to have an idea and then have no stage to perform it in you know totally. so i just kind of like turned into a zombie for a few months well there. then so you know <clears throat> I, I hated it but we did one live stream it was like a rolling stone thing it's uh, yeah this is a big thing the live from hollywood thing was dope <clears throat> but uh i was like i'm only doing one of those <laughs> did you do anything like that? other than doing a podcast i did yeah i, I did a couple live stand-up shows that were more like ted talks because there's nobody in the crowd yeah um and i had our buddies josh and ken um came and opened yeah. for me did one at the at, at the viper room oh nice and then we did one at the dime where it, they were streaming it they were live streaming it so you could like buy a ticket and watch it and so but no clap there was no clap. I mean, Whoa. you could hear like Josh and Ken occasionally, and like I had uh, a couple of my friends would show up to the the. I think the one at the dime was uh, was New Year's Eve. You know, so it's like so right weird. The New Year. So you I know, had a couple friends show like, up. Like we're, we're like, but when's like the punchline? Like no one. Eh. And like you just, just gotta, <laughs> you really, it's a different mindset. Yeah. But I wrote a crap ton of new material for each show, cool. so it's kind of like I was doing a live hour. Now it wasn't honed, but it was just sort of a rambling mess. But we got to some funny occasionally, cool. and again, like audiences were so they had to lower their expectations sure. as to what they're gonna see mm -hmm. as far when, as different. far as entertainment goes. Because this is back when we were like hoping sports were gonna come back. Yeah, but there wasn't anybody in the stands, and they had the car the cardboards. Right? Yeah, they had the cardboard oh. cutouts like it's a movie scene. It was freaking <laughs> weird, man. That was. But yeah. I, I, yeah. I met I met you guys. I guess you know we were still wearing masks, mm -hmm. but like Jam in the Van was doing uh, that's what the West Pico Boulevard location. We were sponsoring it. We did a big show there, and I, I was doing the podcast with you guys, and it was cool <clears throat> to see how you guys were like, well, we gotta we gotta like, you know, pivot a little bit, right? And so I guess the podcast. I mean, you were you were a guest on it, but you weren't a part of it. What was what was the positive when, report with those guys with the Good People Association? That's I'm just kind of their friend, and so gotcha. if they, they needed somebody to pop in the studio. I'm like, Let's yeah, I'll swing by. It was great. It was funny. I, I mean, it. it's nice having a studio and like what y'all have set up here. Yeah, yeah. I'll be that guy for y'all because oh, I nice. got nothing better to do. So <laughs> if you need a guest, I just kind of swing by and I'm like, yeah, hey, I'll hang for a little bit. Nice. But it, it's it's one of those things where I've had my own podcast. I host Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong, which is a weekly show that we now get to do in studio sure. at uh, NBC. But for me personally, like this is more my wheelhouse. 
totally. is just coming in and just being a guest and then leaving and taking a nap and letting you all do all the hard technical stuff. <laughs> like, I have no idea what's making this loud right now. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what, what any of these buttons do. But yeah, but you're dude, doing you, great. But you, you, you're just, you're such a talent. Man. I, James caught you in the La Jolla Comedy Store. I want to come down for that. I mean, you caught it right for a second. Busting a gut, dude. Yeah. When a good was time. that? Was that the? Was that like a couple months ago, or was that a couple years ago? No, it was a couple months. It was in uh, November, I believe. November. Okay, it was October. Yeah. October. Middle yeah, October. The, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, and then I was telling you before we started, my dad used to be the the one of the door guys there. Yeah, that's crazy. How that happened? <clears throat> I don't. I could be saying this wrong, but it was so he was funny. He was roommates with a guy that, like, you know, is, the mom was the owner. What was her name? Uh, Mitzi Shore. And it was, like, yeah. one of the kids, I think. Yeah. Or they were, or they both were living with one of the kids. Probably it's, Scotty Shore if it was down in San Diego. Yeah, I, I must have been. Yeah. And so they, they would go there and they'd work it. My dad was like, dude, I used to see Jim Carrey up there. Oh, yeah. Doing, like, you know, crazy stuff. Sometimes where it's like, oh, this guy's too much. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, like the, the height of all, like, Robin Williams. Uh, and so, anyway, I've just been a big fan of Con for a long time. So that's uh, the, those are the stories, man. Yeah. I lap those stories up because again, these are our heroes, but even they had to work it out. They had to figure out what the line was, for sure. You know, and so you hear about these legendary stories in the '80s of guys like Sam Kinison mm -hmm. coming in at midnight and just wrecking the place. And even he had to find where his line is. He had to find totally. who his who his people were his and style. where his audience was, who he was on stage. And so the people like him and like Robin found it pretty quick, but it's always a developmental process like you never it's it, like it's a lot like golf totally i don't know how it is with music i don't know if y'all write a song and then you then you're playing it for 10 years and you're like man i really could have put a better verse in there but with bits and like with who you are on stage it's like golf because you never really perfect it totally jack nicholas tiger woods all-time <laughs> greats they are always tinkering with their games right well, up until the end you know i i was in Dallas doing some Boone's Bourbon stuff, you know, drop that real quick. Uh, it's delicious. <laughs> yeah. You got COVID? Call me. Um, and it was Craig Conant. I don't know if I've seen his last name wrong okay. or last name right. Anyway, he, he, he was a part of the Jam in the Van too when you did or, uh, the, the Troubadour show. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask about, because I saw it and I was like, why do people do this shit? Hecklers. <laughs> He literally like had to go. Can can, can someone can security get like, because they yeah. were like literally throwing shit at him. Mm -hmm. And it was a packed house. Uh, it was no, it was Houston. Yeah, H weird town. I was not like whatever, but I saw the gentleman come to your show. Da, da, da. It's a long town, Houston. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, you're in Houston. I'm in Houston. Yeah. You want to meet up somewhere? Well, it's three hours to get to you. <laughs> it was it was a funny club though. Joe something. He's coming up. Uh, he's a bald Joe Ferrari Ferrari or something. I forget his last name. He was there. It was a great time. But I'm saying the funny thing that was that blew my mind was like the hecklers. Why do mm -hmm. people get so pissed off at jokes? Like, I'm sure you've had many experiences with that. It doesn't make any sense to me. I think that alcohol hits everybody different, and I think that has a huge part to do with hecklers, as far as the ones that get offended by something. Yeah. And they just want to make it known. And the thing that you have to remember is that you paid for a ticket, or you got a free ticket, however you got into the show, mm -hmm. it's not your show. Yeah. Nobody's coming to see you. Mm -hmm. They're coming to see the comedian. And so you have to understand that just because I paid money to see you is it, it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to like everything you say, oh. you know? And so the, for the comedian, it's like you paid to see me and you paid to see my act. Totally. You don't know what the act is ahead of time or else you probably wouldn't laugh as hard and you'd know the jokes. That's not part of the game. For sure. So comedy likes to keep people on edge. We like to say the unexpected thing and occasionally that's going to rub somebody the wrong way. And it's just a matter of how you handle it. Like politically, the last few years, it's been so polarized. <laughs> yeah. But even at comedians, you have to acknowledge like, well, that's a good joke. Even if I voted for this guy or this gal, somebody says a joke about it that's funny. It's you have it's to funny. you put the funny before everything else sure. i think sometimes audiences or audience members when they get a little too lubricated or the other thing that i find that is universal with hecklers is they just want that attention sure. so bad but it's unearned yeah and yeah. You, you should do an open mic yeah right Pay, paying 20 dollars does not give you the spotlight that totally. costs a lot more okay yeah a ticket to see a show is 20 bucks and you can laugh your ass off for 90 minutes yeah. a ticket to get the spotlight is that costs years and years of grinding it out, Earning traveling it. across the country, doing every crappy room you can, and figuring out what your act is. That's how you get the spotlight. Well, t tell us, you know, you, you got. I would love to hear a bad gig story. Oh man, I mean, there's bad gigs and then there's worse gigs. <laughs> there, I've done, I've done birthday parties, I've done corporate events, we've, I've done. We've had, we've had some weird ones. I did uh, stand up on a bus one time, that was going from downtown Los Angeles to almost Las Vegas. Whoa. From Nevada, which is Las Vegas. This is like an hour and a half ride? With two casinos. 
four hour ride. So a long set. Prim is like right there <laughs> before you get to Vegas. And mind you, this was a bus full of police officers going on their retreat for a fun weekend just to cut loose <laughs> LAPD's <laughs> finest. And my job is to entertain them on the bus with the PA system. It's not like I have a mic or a stage. Sure, I'm just the sure. guy on the bus. <laughs> and I managed to win everybody over. This was like seven in the morning too. Like we left Kudos. super early and they had coolers full of alcohol and nobody touched it at first. And within uh. five minutes of me getting up there and telling jokes, a lot of them are like, I'm gonna need a, a pop or two. <laughs> Everybody, I think, got won over by me, and either because I said a couple funny things, but more likely because they just felt sorry for me. They realized what a gig this is. But the four narcotics guys in the back were just not into it at all. And they were just mean mugging me the whole time. Their mustaches on just- suspect I don't know what I did to them. I don't know what I said. I hadn't done drugs to that point in my life. Yeah, you did start doing drugs to your 42, right? So I, so I hit my 40s and I was like, it's time. Who was booking that gig, huh? Uh, that was one of those random calls that I was working the phones at the comedy store at the time. And so I made a deal sort of under the table with the manager uh, at the time. And uh, it was if anybody calls and they offer a gig like that, that's under $300, I was allowed to just take it outright. But if they call and they offer like, you know, a thousand or two grand for something, then I had to tell the manager, then they'd probably get somebody more experienced. Cause I was still pretty green. Gotcha. Okay. So the comedy store was operating kind of like a, like a, hey, choose your comedian. Like, give us a call. Yeah, it, it happens from time to time. When when I'd be working the phones, we just get people like, hi, we're looking to hire a comedian for a party, and that's not usually what the store is for. Totally. It's just, uh, you know, it's not like we all live there, and they're yeah. like, it's not like Big Brother. Hey, wake up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's go wake up uh, that guy. Red number three, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> well, you know, our buddy Rafa. Uh, I don't know if you remember meeting him at the Troubadour. Um, he. Oh yeah. Yeah, he Rob worked, and I have worked together before anyway. Yeah, he's we're, great. We're buds. He works the phones in the La Jolla store. Yeah, That's yeah. He does during the day. Yeah, yeah. He's and, and he's got a good outlook for it. Like, yeah. I think with every sort of class that gets hired at a comedy club, you need one person like either Rafa or me that's trying their best to look on the bright side of life, <laughs> that is trying to be a positive light, because that job can really run you to the ground pretty quick if yeah. you let it. Yeah, because, I mean, it's late hours. You're still How long you're you do it? trying to get a set. I was doing it from the end of 2004 is when I got hired and then i think i i did my last shift in like 2009 okay but i got made a regular at the comedy store after i was already regular at the laugh factory and the improv nice. so there were multiple nights when i'd be like working the cover booth at the comedy store and then i'd have a gig down the street of the laugh factory wow so i have to like call one of my friends that worked there like hey can you cover for me for 30 minutes i just got to run down and what knock uh, this out that's awesome what a, like that's inspiring i mean dude, when we used to do cover gigs when we weren't touring mm -hmm. in charleston yeah we were living in charleston i mean um you know, dude, we would do seven a week. We do three a day sometimes. Yeah, we do a like a duo, a, a trio, and then a full band. Uh, we were drinking a lot. I was drinking a lot. I don't know if you were drinking. It was a lot like much. part of the pay. You it know? was like you know there was a tab and then the money. And sometimes it'd oh, be man. like we didn't drink, put it on the tab. Yeah. Or we didn't drink, put give us more money. And yeah, sometimes yeah. they'd be like, no. We'd yeah. be like all right, well. Yeah, it's yeah, so yeah, funny. Like beers. the best friend of somebody running a show or running a room is drink tickets. Yeah. Like hey man, we got all the drink tickets you guys want. I'm like, can I eat? <laughs> like uh, I didn't say eat. You'll have some. I said, calories. I said Bud Light. Yeah, you're gonna get carbohydrates. We promise you that. That's funny, man. Yeah, That's when awesome. when we were doing cover gigs for a long time, uh, what was it? Beer works. They they would <laughs> they would make you bring in a case of beer. Okay. And then the bartender would, so you had to bring your own shit. But then the bartender would be like, hey, shots? And we're all like, hell yeah. And at the end of the night, he goes, hey, so those four shots, uh, you know. <laughs> and you're like, fuck! Because uh, we were like so broke. You know what I mean? And we Remember played that? your request. And, and we you played know? every fucking time he asked for Wagon Wheel, you know? So, oh, yeah. Okay. It, but it, it, it's one of the day. things where people yeah. look at it and Love they're like, day. oh, that sounds like so hard and like you're working so hard. Yeah. And um, I guess it's true. But it's also like, what else am I going to be doing? Totally. Am I just going to be home playing video games? Yeah. No, I, I, I have a dream to do this. Yep. I'm not like the good guy at work who's just staying after cranking out TPS reports for totally. the boss. Like, totally. this is something I love doing. So. Well, how was your Coming special? Coming in on Saturday. T tell us about yeah. your special. 
Uh, the new special, we just filmed it, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago. On December 3rd. We played the same night. We had a gig down the street. Yeah, we were warring. We're, yeah. We, we, we should have had, like, a whole beef on social media. Like, <laughs> don't go to Hotel Cafe. <laughs> see the screw, traitors. Screw Mark. You know? <laughs> but how was it? How was it? It was great, man. It was, it was so smooth, and the crew was great. The venue, Dynasty Typewriters, this amazing theater in L.A., they ran cool. both shows. Such a great operation. So I, as I was telling James, like I love when I'm backstage and everything has just been set up perfectly. Sure. And so then it's all on my shoulders to not mess it up. Like, yeah. As long as that's on me, yeah. for whatever reason, I love that feeling. That's awesome. I love competition and I love pressure. And then I just happen to like telling jokes. Nice. Well, so, it's a perfect, yeah. perfect fit, huh? It, it really was, and Molly, the Wonder Dog, got to come out for the Late Show um, for the encore. I love that. So, and it was funny because like I was hey, about to close. Take a picture. Yeah, I was about to close the uh, like I was on my closing bit for the Late Show, and I could hear her backstage, Making like because she noise. was right there, like because she saw Daddy's on stage. She's like, "Well, let me go see Daddy," and it's like, "Not quite, not quite." Oh, so, that's so cute. yeah, we, we we had a good time. I think the the crowds enjoyed it. So, unlike the previous special I taped, which was in a rock club in Chicago, which which Dog Stepfather ended up. Looking Looking great on you know when they cut it together but that night what nobody told any of us was that the venue was booked in all rooms meaning there's multiple rooms there's That's a the band sound? playing next door no. so the band sound is bleeding through and so we really had to like wait out their set that's horrible I was so pissed it was so tough to do we had to delay the second show like 70 minutes or something like that 70 minutes yeah and so the late god bless that crowd because the late show crowd they stuck was around. so good so energetic we awesome. probably wrapped like at 145 and after that, you're, you're hoping to have that feeling of euphoria, like you just won a Super Bowl. And I was just tired. Dang. And like, I don't know if this is going to work at all. Yeah. This show, I, either one of the tapings we did, I, I'd throw it online right now. When's, when's it going to come out? I am hoping for March or April. Nice. So Congrats. now we're in that fun period where it's like, well, do I just want to do it straight to YouTube and, and get it right out to the people? Are yeah. there streaming services interested? So totally. kind of disseminating all that information that you, people you, much smarter than me run. Well, what do you call it? I don't know yet. Okay. I, I was going to call it, let's get this over with. <laughs> I it's don't know yet. I don't know yet is not bad. <laughs> For the times name. we just lived in in the last three years, yeah. I don't know yet. That's like, great. Like, is it safe to go out? I don't know yet. Can we take the mask <laughs> off? I don't know yet. Um, but uh, I was going to call it, let's get this over with for those same reasons. That's cool. You know, because some of these jokes, I'm like, they're pandemic related, and I just, I, I want to document this. So I want to time capsule what we all went through, and then I want to move sure. on with my life. Yeah, but there's a couple other titles that we're kicking around. Nice, so okay. that's we'll killer. See. Yeah, I got a question for you. So we've talked about bad gigs, like the real small ones. <laughs> we've talked about these big, like tapings, yeah. where you probably prepare material for a while. What's like just riffing, man? I just made it all up on the spot. <laughs> oh come on, man! Good. We're no. digging deep on, here. Yeah. What's the difference, and what's your favorite like style of gig to do? Because I know a lot of comedians like to work out material. They'll pop in, mm -hmm. do like work on stuff. Yeah, I think that there's there's two schools of thought when it comes to what a comedian's favorite type of crowd would be. And it really boils down to the venue. Like, do you love being at comedy clubs or do you want to do a theater? And so I can do a theater and sell a bunch of tickets and do one night, one show at a theater on the road somewhere. For sure. Or I can go work a comedy club, maybe Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, something like that, and do multiple shows each night. For sure. And to hone material, I love the club circuit. I love getting to do comedy clubs because you just learn so much. If I get into town, say it's Minneapolis, and I get into town on Thursday, I got one show that night, two Friday, two Saturday, one Sunday. And so from Thursday to Sunday, I'm a better comic by the end of that weekend. Even if I'm headlining, I've been doing this for as long as I have, I learned something, I probably developed a new chunk of material, and sure. now I'm ready to do it on a special. And that takes more than just one weekend, obviously, but you just get these kernels of idea. Like it, that, that's what I would say to any young artist out there, whether you're in music or or stand up, whatever it is, you it, the more you practice your craft, the better you are at it because you get more ideas. So yeah. the more you write, the better of writer you are. But you also like I'll do a, a one hour writing session somewhere and I'm just like typing out, banging out words, stream of consciousness. For and sure. then I'll be driving home and then I just have another idea pop in my head. When, when do you write? When do you like to write in the morning? Definitely, whenever, whenever I, whenever I have to, for <laughs> the writing's the hardest part about it. For sure, because you don't get that juice, that immediate feedback that you get when you're on stage. Are you, know? are you, are you, are you walking around the grocery store? And you, you know, what I mean, is it just kind of like you're in the wild? You think of shit, or it, it can happen. Inspiration can strike anywhere, gotcha. and it usually doesn't strike when you're exactly hoping it will. 
and then it'll hit at a different point. You just have to be ready to capture it. And the the cardinal rule of coming up with new material is write everything down as soon as, possible. as you think of it because you will forget it. It doesn't oh. matter what time of day. And I'll have thoughts come to me after I enjoy some herbal medication at night. And then you're like, oh, I'll definitely remember that. That's sure. a winner. There's no way I'm forgetting this bit. Wake up the next day. It's gone. gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never to be heard from again. Oh. You know, I've heard a comedian say this one time on a podcast that if you think about it more than three times a week, you got to write about it. Hmm. That's good. That's, that's what someone said. If it just keeps <laughs> coming by. And I wonder how that is for musicians, too, because one of my favorite bands is Leonard Skinner. Right. Oh, yeah. And Ronnie Van Zant said that a song you got to write down is a song that ain't worth remembering and i'm That's like that is, ronnie's better a better man than i because well, i ain't remembering any of the stuff i come up with the the last song i put out i was lucky enough to have the keyboard player let me skip well not the original obviously. yeah billy uh, pal's an all-time they call him tickler peter peter keys is really yeah called wicked girl yeah so i had him on it and then it landed randomly and uh you're at my parents place in charleston remember that and I got an email like, hey, NASCAR NASCAR wants to put your song in. And I was like, hell, fuck it. Yeah, Are you man. fan of NASCAR? Now I am. You know, <laughs> um, you know, I want to go fast. No, it was super cool, man. Uh, he was a client of mine through Artist Formula, and <clears throat> he, he just played keys on it. He played B3. Yeah. That's great. That's my uncle's favorite band. He used to follow them around. Oh, yes. One of those Skinner guys. Is just a, they're just an all-time. They were only really together putting out music as the original lineup for maybe four years. Yeah. And they have that entire catalog like i love a, how the band name is literally it was a joke was a diss like a burn yeah, yeah, for their their teacher. yeah. yeah. <laughs> leonard yeah. skinner dude so there are some there are some things that immediately come to my mind where comedy is so immediate you said like the pandemic stuff like no one's clapping like comedy yep. as soon as like we can play a song and and people will kind of like clap regardless of a bunch of factors but if you tell a joke and it's not funny no one's laughing you know immediate feedback i think with musicians it's a little different because you can play a song and you'll get people clapping and you may know on stage like ah that one didn't really connect the way i thought it would yeah. or maybe this connected more than i thought it would but the crowd may not be savvy to that when you're a comedian you tell a joke and it doesn't work everybody in the room knows somebody farted yeah, <laughs> like we yeah. all know we're all in this together I, i've seen good comedians with the way they they save it they make people laugh go all right, that one didn't hit. You know what I mean? Like they'll, they'll, that one didn't hit, or you just try to turn it into like a really long premise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like here's the setup. Here's the punchline. Punchline didn't work. It's like, and then this happened. It's like, hopefully we'll get to the next one. And you just try to bail yourself out. It's, it's That's not cool. unlike a cat falling down the stairs. And you're like, eventually I'm gonna land on my four feet. Totally, totally. I, uh, <laughs> I, I find that just, I find it so cool when I go see you like, dude, I didn't land, but then they, the way that they, and that in itself is an art. You know what I mean? Yeah, and uh, so, like, for instance, when I was doing La Jolla and, and James was spying on me, um, we uh, that was me working out for the special, right? And so that's oh. me, like, tinkering and, like, honing the stuff. But I was... I'm still, I'm at a comedy club, so I'm going to do a little bit of crowd work, more than I would do at the special. But I'm also using that crowd work as an opportunity to be like, is this the best part of the joke? Or is that the best part mm. of the joke? And so it, what you hope the audience doesn't detect is, like, I'll do something that, that works, that I know works, that I've been doing for a while, and then I'll pepper in either a new tag or a new bit right after that, and that'll be the meat in the sandwich. Then I go right back to something I know. Totally. And so you, you get a better read on it, and the crowd has no idea that you just tried something Thing brand new that you thought of in the shower i for love sure. that for we sure. we use that phrase in music too like a tag like you do a tag on a chorus or like yeah, a turnaround yeah. or something i also love that comedians and musicians will have like a rhythm mm -hmm. they'll have or like a like a contour to their set like all right here's the big joke we're gonna end with the big rock song or like they comedians talk about the beat do you have like a a fast beat or a slow beat? I think that my beat is always trying to slow myself down a little bit more than I feel comfortable doing. Because I, I can talk very fast if I want to. You can tell. And that's what a lot of, you, especially young <laughs> comics do, is like they will get on stage and just... Rush. Buh, 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 buh. Because they grow up watching Robin Williams or somebody. And mm. even when you watch Robin, though, he takes <clears> his time when, when he needs to hit a punchline. He wasn't doing a mile. He's, blah, 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 blah. He's all over the place, scatterbrain. For sure. But he'll still take that extra half second to deliver the punchline, to get that laugh. And so every time I'm working on new stuff, I have to consciously remind myself to just kind of slow down and let let the laugh build and then let the laugh dissipate. Totally. Because sometimes you get in that mood, you just want to punch him in the face, just overpower mm -hmm. him. And you can do that for a quick set, but if you're trying to sustain an hour, you really have to let it breathe a little bit. If you want to sure. milk that laugh for another 
you know? Because yeah. those seconds <laughs> add up. You're like, well, yeah. I got an hour special yeah. now. <laughs> and you have to learn it, and it's different in each room because I could tell a joke somewhere, and it just doesn't go that well for whatever reason. But so, then you're doing it in a packed, huge theater, and it does well, and you are trained in your head because this joke hasn't worked that well before to go to the next thing immediately, and then you have to take an extra break. Totally. What's the better set to see? The because I know comedians will do a double set. What is it? The, the early, early show. show? The late show. Which ones? Which ones got more <laughs> spice, dude? It really depends on the night and the environment. The when I taped my special, the first show was a little tighter, just in terms of joke, 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 and that was sort of by design because I want to have a safety show in the can. Totally. And then the late show, you can be a little looser. You yeah. can be, if I'm on the road, maybe I did have a beer in the green room yeah. in, in between shows. Um, Some and herbal so, medication. So just a little bit of something to change it up a little bit. And, but a lot of it is determined by the crowd, you know? And, and as comics, we always go back to the old rule, like you never blame the audience, but when you do a seven o'clock show, that's going to be a different audience totally. than the 9.30 or the 10 p.m. show. How was your 1.45 a.m. crowd for your dog <laughs> stepfather? That's when the real laughs come out. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, they, again, like, I was worried about them just getting two in the bag because they're the, the show's delayed. 70 minutes. Over an hour, oh. and so they're going to order a couple more drinks, and I don't know if that venue even served food, so it could be a real S show, but they just they, they stuck it out, man. What, they what really venue was came it? To play. Chicago? It was Reggie's Rock Club I'm in there, Chicago, there, there, which is a great-looking <laughs> place mm -hmm. and that main room i mean it's awesome it's a really cool rock venue and that's the vibe i wanted for that special for sure and uh man do we get it is that, is that the one <laughs> you know obviously you know i'm a fan i've looked up your stuff you did some with bill burr i did um right i did a couple bill burr is uh is one of the producers of that special that's and of what the it was. new one <clears throat> with all things comedy they're just a great comedic outfit that's based in la that's bill so burr cool. al madrigal two great comics nice. and um they have a great team behind them and they've always been like so cool to me and then Bill had a Comedy Central show that he was doing where you basically tell a story with him and then you go up and you do five minutes of stand up, sort of like what Comedy Central's premium blend used to be way back in the day. I remember that. And so that, that that's what it was. And and Bill and cool. I have always been cool. That's and awesome. he's just he's such he's sort of become that one of like the Rodney Dangerfields of the modern era where Rodney would always take young comedians, like Jim Carrey was one of them. Mm -hmm. Sam Kinison was another one where he'd take a bunch of young comics under his wing and just kind of help them get their career footing. And that's what kinda, Bill's done for a lot of us. I kind of feel like that's what, you know, I mean, I'm not a comedy or co comic, but I, I always try to keep in touch with that kind of stuff. It looks like that's happened a lot in Austin. Have you done a lot, like it's starting to come up, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, with Joe Rogan moving his operation there, I think a lot of other comics kind of flocked over there as well, sure. during the pandemic especially. Mm -hmm. But there's always been a great artist scene. Yeah. in austin particularly with music obviously with South by. you know they have like musician loading you know how like there'll be like a taxi like mm -hmm. valet don't park here they have like musician loading they have musician they it, yeah. health insurance too down there like like the it's it's, it's like <clears throat> the restaurants and the bars that pay musicians they you know it's a tax write-off yeah they pay into this thing where if you pay or if you play x amount of shows a year you can get health insurance mm -hmm. crazy yeah how cool is it it's very nurturing how cool is to that? uh to us heathens yeah who, who <laughs> yeah. buck the trend and I, I mean <laughs> you know i work all the time i do fine but i you know i am always like all right am i gonna get health insurance this year yeah like, right, <laughs> right i mean well, let's be honest though. health insurance isn't the number one thing on our christmas wish list can i can yeah. i get uh can i get that next cocktail you know <laughs> that's, like, yeah. that's more what we're thinking it's like if you just take imagine how healthier we'd be if yeah. you just take one drink off the end of our nights <laughs> on the weekends yeah. and you put that into your health insurance fund <laughs> or, but then you wouldn't need health insurance anymore oh yeah totally yeah yeah oh my god dude you're so funny <laughs> but you know but it's uh it you know it's just it's just so cool to, to hang out with a guy like you because when i moved to la it was like an escape to to and obviously i was always doing well i had like you know i was open up for big bands had songs on the radio i just started that but i was like dude i don't think i'm gonna grow unless i move and you the guys i met at that that uh podcast you mm -hmm. know josh mcuga again or ken knapsack ken yeah. uh what was the other fellow's name uh mark riley mark riley and then yeah, you, the three just, musketeers and i you know obviously you know me and james are like you know homies you know what i mean if i ever get married he'll you know he, he'll be in the second wedding you know oh but, i was gonna say he's yeah. not he's <laughs> he's not the marrier no 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 but i'm just saying I'll marry some people i think I, I started officiating weddings and it's it's great well i mean I'll, I'll, I'll call you all i wanted to say is you guys were so kind and i was like dude i think i like 
Oh yeah, I connect with a lot more musicians. Got to play music, but I was like, I think I kind of connect with these comedians. They're we so nice. We can spell our own. Yeah, and dude. and it, it's a little like the new Avatar movie, where I'm more forest people and you're more the water people, yeah. but we still we're like, hey, we're all on Pandora together, so <laughs> we we're, we're sort of doing the same kind of thing. And and you hear those stories of like the old time, either like big band players or comedians, vaudeville acts, yeah, and they all sort of ran in the same circles because. Who else is going to hang out with us? Totally. You know? Like, totally. you buy a ticket to see us, and then you're like, okay, that was fun. I got to go back to my family. Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> go back to your family? No, you don't want to come out with me and James and Tyler? We're just going to drink all night and talk every, about how great the audience was. Every time I go to Barney's in Santa Monica, there's this really sweet man that runs the valet, and you just Venmo him. Yeah, yeah, And he's yeah, like, yeah. hey, Tyler, my friend, my friend. Yeah. And uh, every time I go, he's just like, hey, it's been a minute. Are you married? I'm like, hell no. Like, <laughs> i just been traveling. Right, you know? right. Do you think you I, think I, think I was married? married? <laughs> oh, it's so Over the funny. weekend, got married. Yeah. yeah. So we've been name dropping some comedians, Kinnison, Dangerfield. Mm -hmm. Who are some of your favorites? And part two, who are some people that you'd love to collaborate with? Some up and comers that you're like, man, that cat's got it going on. Oh, that's a good question. Um, my comedic inspirations were when I was a kid, it was all about Eddie Murphy and Robin Williams. It was like my first two. I had a sort of a reawakening that I liked making people laugh when Jim Carrey had his skyrockets of fame in the 90s. And uh, But as far as a pure stand-up comedian goes, Chris Rock, I think, is the best. Awesome. I, uh, he's, he's my all-time favorite. His first special, Bring the Pain, I remember when I saw it on HBO, and I did not know him from Saturday Night Live at the time. He had already had his run on SNL. I had not seen her to been aware of it or maybe i kind of knew he was in the cast but didn't see that many of his sketches sure it's the it's a perfect comedy special and then he had bigger and blacker and then he just kept blowing up and he's still to this day i think he's just he's the guy that when a news issue happens when something happens in the world i want rock's angle on it before anybody else <laughs> he apparently i've heard a bunch of comedians on podcasts say how hard he works and how he'll go to the the comedy store seller wherever mm -hmm. and he will he'll and on a packed night and just try out some brand new stuff. You oh, know, when everyone's bringing their A game, he's yeah. like, I'm going to work on stuff. That's and I cool. think that's really Especially cool. for him, because as soon as you say the name Chris Rock, it's so cool when somebody at that level pops into a club because sure. there's two ovations that they get. So if I'm bringing him up and nobody knows that Chris is coming up next, then I go up, I do my Loser. act, I say, please welcome to stage Chris Rock. And everybody gets really excited. And then they start looking around, and then he gets on stage, and it's another round of applause because they're like, oh, he wasn't joking. That's wow, actually Chris Rock. That's, that's really the guy. That's cool. But I had the ultimate initiation with him because when he was hosting the Oscars the first time in 2005, he started you know, going around the clubs and working on that opening monologue, which when you watch the Oscars the night of the telecast is a tight 8 to 10 minutes. But he was rehearsing it. He took a raw piece of 45-minute clay, and he had some of his Oscar writers come, and they'd all sit in the back, and they just start slowly chiseled that thing. Wow. And you know Rock's what working on stuff where he, sit, he just goes up and he just sits on a stool. Yeah. Where I'm just going to say stuff, and we're just going to see if there's funny in there somewhere. Totally. He's not full standing, you know, prowling the stage like he does when he's taping. It's just we're going to see if any of this is funny. And I had the pleasure, and I say that with a wink and a nod because I followed him three consecutive nights and again i had been doing stand-up for two years and just happenstance i would have a spot at a club somewhere and rock would pop in obviously he's gonna go wow. up next whenever he wants to and three nights in a row saturday sunday monday nice i and i think it was twice at the comedy store that i did the improv on on uh, monday so you did and different i was like venues. i'm safe here and then he bumped me and i was like i cannot escape having to follow so this technically guy. open up for chris rock he opened up for me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Throw that in the bio. Yeah, yeah, right. But but even like, like going back to learning on, on the fly and learning when you're on stage doing material, I was a better comic after that set Monday than I was before I went up on Saturday because n nobody's prepared for having to follow Chris Rock totally. in a packed house. Oh Nobody. And this oh is like, gosh. I think he was hosting the next week. And so by this point, it was, that set was fire. Wow. That was heat. And that was all he was doing. He wasn't going to go up for just 30 minutes and talk about other funny stuff. Mm -hmm. This is my monologue, and it murdered every time. That is so cool. And then here's the new guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> hey, guys, how about another hand yeah. for uh, my opener? <laughs> oh, God. And then we were walking yeah. out. Yeah, I was a little more confident on Monday than I was yeah. Saturday. <laughs> That's awesome. That's well, yeah, great. man. Well, uh, you know, um, when it comes to, you know. Oh, right some, some, some great comics that, that are coming up, too. 
That I, that, because that was the other part of the question, right? New it's cattle. just these great comics that, like, there's so many of them. Fahim Anwar is a guy who is just, uh, Jesus Trejo is another one. Huge, he's a huge fan of him. Just, they're just so damn funny. And, like, they kill me. They're, they're, they're great. Like, every time I sit down <laughs> and I watch them. The bits are, are like, really yeah. when, when, when When it was the COVID times and the, the Boone's Bourbon was sponsored Jam in the Van mm -hmm. and the secret shows, Fahim, right? Yeah. So he would come up and he was just, like, just nuts. Just oh, like. And it was so funny. I was just like, and it, uh, there was Chris DeSfonsino. Uh, like, De, De, De Stefano, yeah. De he, he was coming up, mm -hmm. and he was actually, just to say, man, he was actually an inspiration to start this podcast because he wasn't doing huge shows yet, right? Like, he was doing shows, but right. like, you know, he wasn't as big as he is now. And the one thing I saw, I was always watching his social media, he started just a silly podcast where it was about nothing, mm -hmm. but it was just like jokes, jokes, content, content, content. And next thing you know, his Instagram was half a million followers. Yeah, I was right, like, right. I was right. like, wow, look at that. People respond to that. Now he's doing huge shit. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? And it was really cool watching all these comedians you're mentioning because they were all at Jam in the Van with like 50 people, and now they're crushing it. It yeah, was so yeah. cool. And and comedians always need a stage. So yeah. it, you you really have to check your ego at the door. That's like, oh, I'm selling out theaters. I'm flying first class. It's like you still got to work on your shit. Yeah. Dude, there's one comedian. I don't know if you – he unfortunately passed away this year, but he used to um, – do shows with Tony Baker and uh, his mm -hmm. name was Teddy Ray. Did you ever hear about I, Teddy Ray? I know of him. Yeah, I know Tony pretty well. This this guy Teddy didn't. I'm convinced he didn't have material, and he would just walk on stage <laughs> mm -hmm. and was so naturally funny. Everyone would just be like, "Some T people Teddy can, Ray. yeah, some people really can do that." Sinbad is a legend. Was that so? For doing that yeah. guy because Sinbad could just he would just walk on stage and just be funny. Yeah, yeah. Didn't yeah. have to really like take a lot of time. Totally. To craft a joke, he was just so naturally gifted that he's he's a one of one. That's cool, isn't he sick? He uh, he had a, he had a pretty bad stroke, and so he's uh, he's just every day is a struggle. But it's so you know, sad, man. He's got all of us uh, having his back. So, uh, you know, it's it's so sad seeing someone that like you know you look up to is like, dude, you're human too. You yeah, I mean? yeah, it's yeah. These, it, especially comedians, we our life expectancy is not that long. <laughs> so every set, every <laughs> breath you get to take is uh, is a blessing. Well, I'm supposed to go down to see someone tomorrow at the La Jolla store. He's, gosh, he's so funny. Polly Shore just posted about him. Really okay. tall, skinny kid. I forget his name. He's doing oh, Saturday and Sunday. I'm going to see Rafa. Gosh, I can remember his name, but... Um, Give but me anyway. the hair. Give me the hairstyle. Uh, you got the hair? It's just kind of like, you know, he's a tall, skinny guy. It's a little long on the sides, blonde. Jeremiah Watkins? No. Not him. <sighs> he's he's very funny, though. He's Check great. Jeremiah I can, Watkins I can out. find it. You but, know who's another great one that I really like from the South is uh, Dusty Slay. Dusty Slay is great. His, he's, yeah. from his, he's from Charleston. Mm -hmm. So talk, talk yeah. about a different style of beat. Right. You know what I mean? Right. His beat is very, like, a little awkward. <laughs> We're having a good time. We're having a good time. You know, like, yeah. it's just, yeah. it just it just goes to show there, there are so many different styles, and I love that, like, musicians mm. and comedians will have kind of, like, a set list, but they're, like, all right, if I'm really killing it, we're going to throw this in there. And, like, they're like little add-ons. Yeah, you have to be able to so adjust somewhat on the fly and in the moment. And I liken that to playing a position like quarterback where you see, you have to see what the defense is before. Because the quarterback could go in there and tell you, okay, we're definitely going to do a lot of play action. You know, we'll do a lot of RPOs. We'll probably take a couple deep shots. But it's not until you get up in front of the line and you see what the defense is showing you. For sure. And then you're like, oh, okay, this is going to work. And then I can put this in. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all about those sort of halftime adjustments. And the comedians that I admire most are the ones that are just very, I'm going to tell the joke. And it's a non sequitur, like Mitch Hedberg, Stephen Wright. Oh, yeah. Folks yeah. like that. Even David Tell to some extent where it doesn't really bleed into the next joke. Because I don't know how they remember that stuff. Like, a lot of my stuff is just, it, it transitions like a, into the next bit. I am so impressed with folks who can tell a joke about a mailbox, and then the next joke is about an airplane. And it's like, you didn't get there from one or the other. You just the, It was funny enough to where here's the joke, yep. and Anthony Jeselnik's good at doing that, where here's a joke, and I'll maybe tag it a couple times, and then I'm done with that bit, and it's not going to transition into anything else. It's just, and we're back to it doesn't, point A. It That's doesn't cool. build. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool, man. Um, you know, <clears throat> we got we got a couple more minutes here, but uh, what I was going to ask earlier is, you know, in your life right now, are you still trying to tour all the time, or are you trying to put out content? I'm done. Both. I'm done. I taped the special. I'm retired. Uh, yeah, this is no, me announcing. No. I'm, I'm I'm hanging it all. Is up. this it right this here? Is, yeah, this I is your last. Too hard for too long. <laughs> I'm so, dude. I'm so lazy right now because I worked my ass off just for like years. like doing clubs, and uh, I'm not actually retired, but like I doing clubs 
for the last, I don't know, really six months, like intense uh -huh. training for the special yeah. and getting my body in shape and like trying to look good. Yeah. I gained eight pounds in a week. Because I did the after, special Saturday after, night. After Sunday was the after party, and it was just me drinking and watching football all day. With your and dog. Really ha I really haven't left the after party yet. I'm still kind of the guy that's just hanging around. Yeah. This is like the after, after, after party. That's fine. And so the holidays are going to be rough for me. It's going to be a very different looking Mark Ellis who emerges January 1st. He might see his shadow and just continue the after party for another six weeks. But eventually I'll get back to uh, to what I do best. Well, cool, man. But I mean, like, you know, but are, are you trying to like, you know, I love Zanies in Nashville. I've gone, I mean, are you trying to like hit the road? Yeah, trying I'm, to... I'm trying to set up some dates. I'll probably tour lightly the first few months. And then when the special comes out, that is when I'm hoping to at least have enough new material to kind of tour with and off the heat of the special there's a the new perceived heat that will be on the special well there's a new there's a new uh, comedy uh, venue in charleston that's the sparrow is now a comedy club is that so yeah like you really know, you know dave hill i <clears throat> he, he does he does the music thing and okay he, he's like he's a guitar player but and he's um, funny too he's he's actually pretty darn oh, funny I, yeah. those are the ones that i hate he did like, like a, you can't be good at two things well he does like, the, like he goes cheap. on stage he shreds and he does like the 12 days of christmas <laughs> yeah and it's fucking so funny it's like like, like al yankovic yeah. it's like you're you're too good yeah yeah, yeah. too many different things he's he's a cool he's, he's a tour with what's a scary pool party or something the the, the i forget the guy but no anyway. check his stuff out yeah yeah but, but i'm saying like you know the the you ever like tour the southeast i think that's the, the coolest place to tour charleston is such a cool vibe and yeah. i've never performed there oh really do it i've never done like a show or a club there so yeah you're telling me there's a new there's a new opportunity in charleston yeah i'm there it's great Let's um go. you know I, I think the southeast is dope and you know we did a huge tour from like texas to to nashville down mm -hmm. to louisiana alabama when i just started this the bible and, belt swing dude well it's, it's one hour one hour you're in the next town yeah. you know what i mean out yeah. in california it's it's not like that mm -hmm. you know what i mean i'm mean, yeah. obviously there's comedy clubs but just touring's different you know what i mean markets are a little bit more spread out west yeah. Yeah. i i love just getting to be in a new city for a few days and just uh, sort of getting the vibe and the read and seeing what the crowds are like and I'll go off on my own and just, you know, find a cool restaurant or a bar or a museum or something. And I decided I love just getting that little dose of traveling for sure. You know, it's it's great. It hasn't caught up to me yet. Um, I have no real desire to start a family <laughs> other than just more dogs. So <laughs> I'm in a I'm in a pretty good spot. And, nice, uh, you know, meeting folks like you is one of the real hidden gems of this job is that well, you just get to meet my guy uh, artists who are, you know, passionate about similar stuff and then occasionally they let you host their show at the troubadour and you're like hell yeah i'll do a gig of the troubadour dude i was hung over for three days after that <laughs> i was so there's a lot messed. of boons in that green room oh dude i didn't i didn't eat i went around. down i was like can i get a 12 hour hot dog like i was so messed i'm up, the dude. same way i don't like eating before shows yeah so i just like to eat after the show is done but like after my special i had like a quest bar all day and i'm like oh my god yeah i went to 7-eleven many big bites were consumed <laughs> at 1 30 in the morning well, you know, James, you got some fire off questions. Yeah, we got some rapid fire. You answered most of them, but I'll hit you with some <laughs> quick questions. You can hit me some quick answers. All right, I'll answer deflect. as quickly as possible. Like a politician. Cool. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite part about this industry? I cannot answer that as quickly as possible. Um, the uh, I guess the the ability to speak my mind is my is my and w without f fear of repercussion. Although that's changed a little bit. Totally. Um, I think that I just enjoy. The honestly, if I'm being as honest as I possibly can, and it might seem a little shallow, my favorite part about this industry is that I get to make people happy. Cool. What's the most surprising part? That they are actually happy. I love <laughs> After that. I talk to them, that, that I'm still shocked that they laugh at my dumb bullshit. That's awesome. What's the most important lesson you've learned from Star Wars? Um, that there is one force that unites us. Uh, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it, but it surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. And if you don't honor that system, then it will betray you. That's what, cool. What's your midichlorian count? I'm doing about 10K. <laughs> yeah, but I'm looking to up it and I'm taking some vitamins that I think might help that. That was so fast. Yeah, that's what the M drive shake is. <laughs> that's awesome. Plenty of protein and some midichlorians. <laughs> Oh my God. Where can listeners follow up with you online, Mark? <laughs> uh, all the social media stuff is Mark Ellis Live. Um, Instagram is there. If Twitter's still around when this goes up, then you can find uh, me there too. So, that's funny. Uh, any of those other apps, m most of the other apps that have like sprung up, you know, just to trying to maybe be the next Twitter. I'm Mark Ellis Live on those too. I haven't investigated them at all. Have you seen the new feature on Instagram? No. It's like it's like aim away message. You go to your messages. Oh, you yeah. You put like a little like 10 second thing, go, hey, what's up? 
I, I, I've just been putting poke, so I'm poking the person next to me. Okay, it's, all right. It, they're trying to be like Twitter. All right, well, maybe I'll, st- maybe I'll poke you in the yeah, near yeah. future, sir. <laughs> do you, mem- do you remember that feature on Facebook? I remember the away message on AIM. Oh, I, dude, I, I used to have a... BRB. I could say yeah. who, but it was a teacher in college and used to... <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is going on? Oh, like, you guys <laughs> talking about poking? Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah like somebody would like, send you a message and like ask you to do something, and you you just like ignore it, you forget it, and then you get a poke, and it's like... Why are you poking uh, me, dude? Mom, stop poking yeah. me. <laughs> Mom. Yeah, Dad. usually it's it's like if somebody of a your previous mom's generation. poking you. I thought it was more of like a flirtatious thing. Um, I don't think my mom knew what the poke was. She's just like, oh, this is something I can do to interact with my boy. And I'm like, mom, poke away, lady. Stop poking. Yeah. Me. Well, hey, if she's poking me, it keeps her off the street. Yeah, good, <laughs> good. Well, hey, dude, do you drink? Do you want to take a little little? How do you do? I'll, I'll, I'll take a little right. swig with you fellas in the afternoon. Grab, grab, yeah. grab dude, glass. so much fun hanging with you, Mark. Yeah, you got you guys are the best, and um. Again, I respect the musicianship, but also the fact that you can make delicious bourbon. I'm looking forward to seeing your, your uh, seeing your special and the next time you're on the road, man. Do you have any shows during the holidays? Um, I got a couple shows that are lined up, but I'll probably take about seven or eight days off around Christmas. And then usually what I like to do, like my big comeback for ushering myself into the new year is literally New Year's Eve. I love performing New Year's Eve. Hell yeah. The crowds are great. They're the perfect amount of lubrication. They're excited. And, um, you know, you get a couple jokes in you, a couple... Anything in L.A.? A couple of these. Yeah, I usually like to ring in the New Year at the Comedy Store, so we'll see, oh, what, no. the, I'm, uh, I'm we'll see what the lineup is. So if y'all are around for New Year's, let's yeah. uh, let's do it right. This is my first uh, holiday in California. Well, last year I stayed for Christmas, but not yeah. for New Year's, so yeah. I'm stoked. Let's bring some Charleston Cheers. Christmas cheer. Cheers, man. To Cheers, Los Angeles. Man. Cheers, Cheers fellas. You gotta take a little sip, though. Salut. Cheers. Mmm. <sighs> yeah? What's the last time you had it? Probably, I had bourbon fairly recently at Thanksgiving, but it was not, I we did not locate any boons, so uh, cool. this is the good stuff. Yeah, man. It's and I a, got like a thicker mustache than I did last time I was here, so I got like the Sam Elliott, I'm tasting it off my mustache. <laughs> mm. Next morning. Yeah, this and my cool little boots. This is the closest I get to being in Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, we thank you so much, Mark. You're the shit. Uh, huge fan of you, man, so thank you so much. Hey, you folks are the Cowboys, I'm just your ranch hand. Thank, thank Hit you, me buddy. up anytime. Cheers. Cheers, man.